Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching The Real Reason Behind the American Civil War by Kings and Generals. I just saw this video pop up in my feed and I decided to react to it, thought it sounded interesting. Now if you ask me what the real reason behind the American Civil War was, the short answer is slavery. The long answer has a bit more complexity, but it really boils down to slavery. So, in this video, we're going to see what Kings and Generals' answer to that question is. Now, if you end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon. It is linked down below. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. On April 12, 1861, South Carolina troops opened fire on federal forces in Fort Sumter, mm. initiating the American Civil War. You know, not really a history note, but I've actually visited Fort Sumter. You know, visit Charleston, take a nice little boat ride out to Fort Sumter. Uh, it, was, it was a cool historical site to visit. I mean, the point where the Civil War began, a pretty momentous moment in American history. I definitely recommend it if you're in the area. Four years and two million casualties later, the North would stand triumphant over a broken and devastated South. Yeah. What drove the Southern slaveholding states to war is simultaneously complicated and extremely simple. Numerous yeah. disputes and confrontations had threatened- It's like, I agree with that, right? Because any historical event is complicated, but it's simple because at the root of it, it's slavery, right? There's complexity to that. You know, there were a whole lot of things going on, but when you boil it down, it, it really is slavery that sort of inspired this whole thing, caused this whole conflict in one way or another. So I, I, I sort of agree with that, uh, I think, if that's where they're going. <laughs> and the union between the states since independence. However, the only issue that the democratic process failed to overcome was slavery. Yeah. Ultimately, it was the fear-driven need to preserve the institution of slavery that caused the American Civil War. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And it really was an issue that, I mean, this was an issue since, well, before the founding of the country, right? This is something that was debated uh, when we had uh, constitutional conventions, debated really at every step of the revolution, the question of slavery. You know, you had abolitionists generally from the North, and you had a lot of influential planters from the South who wanted to protect the institution of slavery. From an early point, even some of those planters recognized that slavery was not a sustainable institution. I mean, you can read Thomas Jefferson's writings on slavery, right? This was a man that owned many slaves, and yet he was very concerned about the long-term sustainability of slavery, and he felt that the institution would really be a big problem for American politics, and he was right. You know, it was an issue that they kept debating and there were a whole series of bills and compromises and, you know, none of them were sufficient to solve the problem. And the problem was that slavery existed, right? The only solution to this in the end was the end of slavery. But the, the sort of, like I said, the block of the, especially the planter elite, but, you know, the South generally just was not willing to do that. Uh, until it came to literal armed conflict. There was no doubt of this at the time. There should be no doubt now. Absolutely. The introduction to our Absolutely. And that's something we need to remember, especially with an issue like this that becomes very politicized. Don't let the politics get in the way of the history, right? This war was about protecting slavery for the South, right? That is why this thing started, right? There's... A lot of people say it was about states' rights and this and that, but you ask the question, okay, states' rights to do what? States' rights to own slaves, right? So, like I said, don't let the politics distract from the truth, which is slavery was at the center of this. Our new series on the American Civil War, where we will discuss the lead-up to the deadliest war in American history and discuss the causes that led to it. Mm. Spoiler alert, it was slavery. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're at the when same you page. <laughs> war, you leave behind certain securities of everyday life. But these days, there's at least one you can take with you. Oh. And it's the digital shield that is our sponsor right. today, NordVPN. I'll let the ad play through. You know, we want to support these uh, fantastic creators. So we'll watch through this. 
I'll link their video down below, so y'all should go and check it out. Network can detect your presence there, and if the network isn't encrypted, then they can pretty much steal any communications you have. What? E.g. your <laughs> passwords when you log into something. R reacting to the commercial. Have NordVPN installed on your devices. With NordVPN, all data transfers are encrypted separately to the network's own protocols, guaranteeing that even if someone knows you're sending something valuable to thieves, there's no way for them to get it. Mm -mm -mm. And whether traveling <laughs> or at home, you can also use the other side of NordVPN, change your IP address to all sorts of locations. Guys, I need to start, I mean, I'm way too small to get any sponsors, but all I'm doing is playing up the sponsors of the YouTubers that I react to. Come on, man. <laughs> territory for one reason or another, and there's usually quite a lot of this. So for peace of mind and more access to the world's internet, sign up to NordVPN. There you go. You can now get four months extra subscription on a two year plan if you buy NordVPN at our link, nordvpn.com slash kings and generals, and try it risk free thanks to their 30 day money back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash kings and generals. The eminent Civil War historian James M. McPherson describes slavery as the basic and most deep-rooted cause of the Civil War, a stance with which we wholly and unequivocally agree. While the immediate cause of the war was Southern secession and numerous other issues exacerbated tensions, mm. the proximate cause was slavery. Yeah, that, that's basically what I was saying as well. You know, there were a lot of causes, but these causes, you know, all came back to the root of the problem, which was slavery, right? Like I said, things like states' rights, the big issue here was essentially slavery. And slavery created and made every other issue worse, and every other issue was made worse by slavery, right? So it all it sort of comes back around. Absent that peculiar institution... And, yeah, the peculiar institution. And really, when you look at it, it's sort of like kind of not surprising slavery was truly essential to the way of life in the south i mean that economically politically socially i mean the southern economy revolved around this institution you know the social life um revolved around the white supremacy right i mean that's how it was structured and politics was also deeply uh, intertwined with this institution and so unsurprisingly sort of everything else, all these other issues that emerged all came back to slavery, the institution at the heart of the antebellum South. And of course, you know, politics just wasn't enough to remove this institution. It, it just wasn't going to happen. It took, you know, full-on warfare uh, because it was so essential. Now, of course, one of the questions is, had the Civil War not happened, here we're, we're talking a counterfactual alternate history, had the Civil War not happened for whatever reason, would slavery have survived? How long would it have survived? I can't really tell you. It was clearly unsustainable in the long term, right? And I think probably in the long term would have declined or died out. Um, but once again, I mean, we, we, do, we don't we don't know the alternate history and how long would that have taken? I mean, we can look at other countries like Brazil uh, and slavery in those countries lasted quite a bit after the end of the Civil War. So uh, you don't really know. There would have been no Civil War. However, you shouldn't take historians' word for it, for the Confederates' own words agree with them as well. Yeah, no, this is an issue. And... I've already talked about don't let the politics get involved. Like I said, this is a sort of politically relevant issue, at least in the United States, right? There's a big debate, or I don't know if I want to call it a debate. There are a lot of people in this country who have a particular view. We call it sort of uh, lost cause mythology, right? That see the Southern cause as something honorable and usually try to convince you that slavery actually wasn't the main part of this. But if you read the sources from the time, and I'm not a Civil War historian, so keep that in mind, but if you read the primary sources from the Confederates themselves, you will see that they were wholly concerned with preserving slavery, right? So, you know, once again, the sort of professional historians largely have a consensus on this, but if you can't take their word for it, Go and read the primary sources. <laughs> the Confederates were quite open about slavery being their reason for revolt. 
in personal letters, church sermons, newspaper articles, and even their founding documents. Yeah, you can read the constitutions of these Confederate states, and several of these constitutions will outright mention the preservation of slavery. <laughs> the Confederates repeatedly stated that maintaining slavery was the entire reason for secession. The second line of Mississippi's Declaration of the Causes for Secession states that our position is thoroughly identified with the yeah. institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Uh, but this is a, I don't know if I'll say a famous quote, but in this conversation, this is a pretty well-known quote that you'll see come up a lot, but for obvious reasons, it's pretty informative, right? It then proceeds to lay out 17 grievances regarding the threat to slavery by free states before declaring, we must either submit to degradation and to the loss of our property worth four billions of money, or we must secede from the union framed by our fathers to secure this as well as every other species of property. Right, and so I talked about the state's rights framing. Another framing of this is it was about property rights. What property? Human beings? <laughs> we're, the property we're talking about is the ownership of other human beings. That's slavery. <laughs> like it all, like I said, it all comes back to slavery, man. The original seceding states, who made their own declarations, had the same grievances and drew the same conclusion. Yeah. Though far less concisely. <laughs> yeah. The Confederate Constitution was similarly clear about defending slavery. It was mostly copied from the US Constitution, except for adding protections for slavery and restricting internal improvements. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny, you know, you have the Confederate States of America seceding and forming their own new country, and the both the Union and the Confederacy try to, you know, sort of claim to be the legitimate inheritors of the project of the Founding Fathers. Now, it's pretty obvious to most that the Union had the legitimate claim to that legacy because they were literally the same country running on the United States Constitution, but the Confederacy really desperately wanted to claim, no, 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 we are the legitimate inheritors of the project perpetuated by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And of course, a lot of those guys were slave owners, so, <laughs> you know, they, they certainly had that in common with them. And so, like, they, you know, something like that, just mostly copy the United States Constitution, try to frame it like, no, you know, we are the true America. We're the true inheritor of American liberty and freedom. Of course, all of this is extremely hypocritical when you're revolting in order to perpetuate your ownership of millions of people in bondage. Article 1, Section 9, Line 4 of the Confederate Constitution states, No bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. While Article 4, Section and 3... I already talked about how slavery was a big question in uh, the Constitution and around that time. Of course, we ended up with it, slavery and both connected and separately um, sort of civil rights, right, for people of different races. Uh, one of the results was the Three-Fifths Compromise, of course, very controversial. Um, and a lot of people, you know, there was a big debate about some people, abolitionists, wanted abolition to be in the constitution there just wasn't enough support for that um on the other end some people you know some of your more pro-slavery politicians wanted something like you know a very strong protection of slavery in the united states constitution which of course didn't happen i mean one of the reasons why there continued to be this debate over slavery for decades following the founding of the country that led to the Civil War is because the Constitution was kept pretty vague on the topic, which at the time was sort of a compromise measure in order to get the thing done, right? Because there were such differing opinions. Um, but of course, the downside of that is that, well, first of all, slavery survived for decades after that, but it remains this really... Uh, intense political issue that would end up tearing the country apart. Free specifically allows slavery in any new territories. In defending this constitution, the Confederacy's vice president, Alexander mm. H. Stevens, explicitly confirmed that the Confederacy was specifically created to defend slavery. In his famous cornerstone speech, he states, 
the new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, <laughs> African slavery as it exists among us, Jeez. the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. I mean, you can see, even in the way he's fr he's framing it, and a lot of these documents are framing it, like I said, they're framing this peculiar institution of slavery as sort of essential to their way of life, to their country, you know, essential to not only their economy, but like to their civilization, right? You can see the way they talk about it, how important and essential it was to them, um, which of course is very disturbing to hear, but also is sort of all the evidence you need that like this was what they were most concerned about uh, with secession from the Union. They, they tell us. He further asserted that contrary to the Declaration of Independence proclamation that all men are created equal, our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is mm. not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. And and that's the white supremacy at the heart of it all. And of course, you know, that white supremacy would very much survive the Civil War, right? I mean, we have the Civil War, which is caused by all of this. Then we go into Reconstruction, which was an attempt from the Union, from the sort of Republicans of the North, to restructure the country and to promote some degree of civil rights. But Reconstruction basically ends up falling apart and the south you know sinks into jim crow right what we know is jim crow a segregationist america um and, and that white supremacy would persist so you know that's a really uh, sort of substantial uh, issue at the root of a lot of things right that very much lasted beyond the institution of slavery Throughout the speech, Stevens blatantly and unequivocally rejects all American founding principles which could threaten the institution of slavery. He made no effort to hide the truth that the South was seceding to continue the enslavement of Africans. Confederate President Jefferson Davis preferred to be more guarded about <laughs> secession's causes and always couched them in terms of property rights. However, he never publicly disagreed with Stevens and no evidence exists that he did so privately. Yeah, well, you know, I've also visited the White House of the Confederacy, which is uh, in Richmond right here, um, which I, I, th I think maybe we're on a timeline, but if we're talking about the whole Confederacy, we should probably highlight the whole thing. Anyway, uh, the Confederate White House, um, which is a another really interesting site. There's a lot of fascinating Civil War history, uh, of course, in the region. Uh, and Jefferson Davis was... You know, he was, uh, I don't know what you, uh, not moderate, that's not the word I'm looking for, but like they said, a little more restrained. However, I think with Jefferson Davis, sort of once he was in, he was in, right? Once he was committed to the job, committed to the Confederacy, he, you know, he was ready to go, right? He would um, sort of throw his reservations to the side, um, and so... You know, that, that is, to my understanding, sort of more how he operated on, like, a personal level, right? In fact, it's quite clear from his words that he had the exact same sentiments as Stevens. In his farewell address to the Senate, he repeatedly defended the idea that Africans were inferior and deserved to be slaves, as in the Constitution, we find provision made for that very class of persons as property. They were not put upon the footing of equality with white men. You know, it's interesting. If we look at the um, ideology of pro-slavery advocates, we can see a change over time. Well, makes sense. Ideology is always changing. But, you know, in the sort of early days of the Republic, you know, around the time when men like Thomas Jefferson, your founders, were more um, active in politics, there was a perspective on slavery that someone like a Thomas Jefferson held where, I mean, it's deeply hypocritical, but the perspective was that, you know, well, you know, slavery is sort of necessary, but it's not good, right? And we should work towards ending it. 
Um, and of course, a lot of this was wrapped up with advocacy against the slave trade, which of course was abolished years before the Civil War, right? That, that was a big topic, right? People who may have defended slavery, but were opposed to the slave trade. Of course, the slave trade continued illegally and internally, but the, the sort of official Atlantic slave trade to the United States had been uh, made illegal. Now, as we go deeper into the antebellum period, closer to the Civil War, that pro-slavery perspective, because, I mean, that that's what it was, right? That's still a defense of slavery at the root of it. You're saying, well, you know, it's not good, but we still need it. As you get further into the time period, that, that perspective starts to shift or it becomes less popular in favor of uh, a, a different perspective, which was far more sort of blatantly pro-slavery. I, I think perhaps a response to attacks on slavery by the growing abolitionist movement to the north. Of course, as we get into particularly the, I'd say the 1820s and forward, the abolitionist movement became stronger and stronger. And, you know, the anti-slavery movement became far bigger in scale. A perspective developed and became popular among pro-slavery people uh, that, well, you know, essentially relying more uh, on the argument that Africans were only suited for slavery, they weren't suited for freedom, and that essentially these white planters were doing them a favor, uh, bringing them over from Africa, and that they were treating them well, and that, I mean, it's all abhorrent, but that was the argument that sort of became more popular. So you've got to shift from, well, it, it's bad, but it's necessary to it's necessary, and it, it's good, right? It's a positive contribution, because Black people are not suited for freedom, uh, and, and this is, you know, their natural state, and, you know, uh, this is better for them, basically, right? That that was an argument being made, uh, and so as slavery becomes more sort of under attack from the abolitionist movement, I think a lot of the advocates sort of cemented their views and became more radical, more pro-slavery, um, you know, even more <laughs> white supremacist, right? Now, of course, that's very complicated. There were a lot of different perspectives. It wasn't just like, you know, it wasn't like you were either completely pro-slavery or you were completely anti and an advocate for civil rights, right? A lot of the anti-slavery advocates were also very racist. You know, there were a lot of people who were like, yeah, I don't like slavery, but civil rights for black people? No thanks, right? So it's all of that. But I, I do think that's an interesting ideological shift we can see from the early Republic through to the Civil War. In a speech to the Confederate Congress, he celebrates their freedom from a persistent and organized system of hostile measures against the rights of owners of slaves in the southern states, ensuring abolitionists wouldn't be thus rendering the property in slaves so insecure as to be comparatively worthless, and thereby annihilating, in effect, property worth thousands of millions of dollars. Overall, it can be seen that there was never any ambiguity or dissension. The southern states openly seceded in order to continue the chattel slavery of Africans, yep. and they trumpeted that fact to everyone. Hey, there this we leaves go. the question of There's how the whole there confederacy. came to be any ambiguity or dissent over the Civil War's causes, when those huh. behind the war were so open about what was happening. Well, there are two reasons. I mentioned the lost cause. I imagine that's what they're getting into. I This video has been really good so far. Um, I like how we've talked about the causes, and I think now how the causes have become fuzzy to a lot of people. The first is a lack of focus on slavery from legitimate scholarly sources. Early historians who wrote about the Civil War did not see the need to write about slavery. That slavery was the primary cause of the war was considered a settled point. Thus, most scholars focused on untangling the web of other contributing causes and let slavery fall to the side. Yeah, I mean, there's two parts to this. One is that also a lot of professional historians since the Civil War, I mean, it's way, way, way less common now but especially in the aftermath, did buy into the Lost Cause mythology. Uh, and also, of course, just the fact that history, uh, the professional practice of history has changed a lot, right? I mean, today we do a lot more social history, cultural history, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a lot more of cause and effect than recounting events, 
Whereas in this time period, sort of your what we might see today as straightforward event-based political history or military history was a lot more in vogue, a lot more dominant. And I think that sort of naturally places less of a focus on something like civil rights and slavery and, and, and these types of things that we might have more of a focus on today. So I think part of that is the sort of changing focus of the historical profession, the academy, um, and then also part of that, like they said, might be that they thought it was sort of a settled thing, right? Everybody understood. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, part of that is also lost cause mythology. After all, there's little academic need to write about established facts when there's obscura to be investigated. Mm. This lack of focus created a perception that slavery was less important to the conflict than it truly was. And, and like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm really not an expert on this topic. This is not my sort of field of expertise. So I'm not that familiar on Civil War historiography, right? Um, so you'd have to dig a lot deeper to really dig into what exactly was at the root of a lot of this and how it changed over time. Another reason that slavery fell to the wayside in Civil War historiography was deliberate obfuscation by the Confederates themselves. Yep. Having lost the war and facing the judgment of history, they sought to distance themselves from their indefensible championing of slavery. Mm -hmm. In a post-war diary entry written while imprisoned and in subsequent correspondence, Confederate Vice President Stevens claimed that his extemporaneous cornerstone speech was misquoted and miscopied by a reporter. Well, this is the thing. I mean, the, like, sort of full lost cause movement didn't, wasn't <laughs> immediately in full swing, but we start to see the inklings of it like, essentially immediately at the end and in the aftermath of the war, when a lot of the people involved in the Confederate government and military try to distance themselves. And that, that really is sort of the start of the Lost Cause mythology, because then later, you know, writers and historians, some historians, will look back on that and say, see, it, it wasn't actually slavery. Um, but you always get this. When something terrible has happened in the aftermath, Everyone always tries to distance themselves from it. Everybody always says, well, it wasn't really that. It wasn't me. It was that guy just following orders, right? That classic excuse. This is what happens uh, after any one of these things. And that the real issues were constitutional questions over states' rights. States' rights to do what, I wonder? <laughs> his claim is undercut by his other claim that the misquotes occurred despite consulting with the reporter after the speech suggesting that Stevens is responsible for his own misinterpretation. <laughs> More damning, Stevens was an avid letter writer and newspaper contributor, mm. yet never mentioned being misquoted nor offered to correct the record before his incarceration. Davis would similarly change his tune, claiming that the war had been fought for the inalienable right of a people to change their government, and the right to withdraw from a union into which they had, as sovereign communities, voluntarily entered. Slavery was incidental to that issue, a complete reversal of everything both men had said prior to the war and everything their own state's secession documents said. Yeah. Cre uh, this is the thing with history, man. Um, th there's this phrase, history is written by the victors. I hate this. It's not true. History is written by the historians. <laughs> I, I say that as a joke, but also history is not necessarily written by the victors, right? Um... It's all about, you know, history is about a lot of things, but it's about narratives, really. If you read history, everyone's got some sort of agenda or narrative or something, right? Even if you're trying to do objective history, you have an argument to make, right? That, that's what academic history is sort of about. And so it's not about you know, the Confederates lost the war and largely, you know, they're not interpreted favorably by Americans in American history. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, oh, yeah, they, they won the battle over historical interpretation. But this idea, this lost cause mythology has remained, right? Uh, it, it has been influential for a long time. And so history is written by the victors isn't true. And it's a vast oversimplification as well, right? History is the writing of history, historiography. It's a very complicated thing. It's a very complicated process of writing history. It involves a lot of different people. Uh, and it's really about who can craft a narrative 
that can be sort of spread and believed, um, especially if it's picked up by institutions that can spread it, right? I mean, and that is sort of, you know, how history is made. If you can craft, uh, I guess, a convincing narrative, that, that doesn't mean that it's a true narrative, by the way, it just means it's something that people will believe, then that's you making history right there. That's you writing the history. So that's why a lot of this is important and still influential today, right? This is, uh, we're really fighting over the interpretation of history, <laughs> right? It's sort of a, uh, especially when stuff like this is relevant to modern day American politics, this is all pretty important stuff in my opinion. Credible historians dismiss Davis and Stevens' obfuscations as self-serving and blatant falsehoods. This myth-making was aided by the work of Jubal Early. Acting on what he believed were Robert E. Lee's final orders to his troops, Early sought to romanticize and celebrate the Confederacy as a noble lost cause in numerous there articles for the Southern Historical Society and newspapers in the 1870s. These works, coupled with other former Confederates' memoirs, created a mythology to protect the South from the bitter reality of what it had done and the unjust institution it had fought to preserve. Mm. This didn't fool anyone post-war, as Union General George H. Thomas noted in 1868, the greatest efforts made by the defeated insurgents since the close of the war have been to promulgate the idea that the cause of liberty, justice, humanity, equality, and all the calendar of the virtues of freed men suffered violence and wrong when the effort for southern independence failed. This is, of course, intended as a species of political cant, hmm. whereby the crime of treason might be covered with a counterfeit varnish of patriotism yep. so that the precipitators of rebellion might go down in history hand in hand with the defenders of the government, thus wiping out with their own hands their own stains. Yep, I mean, exactly right. And, you know, on the sort of interpretation of history again, you know, in... I'll speak about America, right? Because that's what I know. I think this is true in a lot of places, but especially in America, you know, well, at this point, right, uh, sort of professional history is still in a, a rather early phase. <laughs> you know, you do not have the sort of academic institutions that you do today. Um, it's a lot more accessible, I guess you would say. Well, not really, because most people are not educated. Um but it's accessible in the sense that a lot of people can get involved in making history. Um, there's good and bad to that, right? Um, but even today, right? I want to fast forward to today. Yeah, we have the American Historical Association, but unlike other historical associations in other countries, it does not wield a lot of power. You know, it does not have a lot of influence, and it doesn't assert itself very much. Right? The American Historical Association is like mostly pretty hands-off. And so the historical institution, academics, right? These different universities just sort of operate autonomously, right? And of course, there is a historical community and there's conferences and we can see trends and, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, there is some sort of, you know, unified movement, Um people work together, but it's not like, you know, we have this one strong institution that directs things. And I don't think it should be like that, right? That That's not really how I would want uh, academic history to work. And so you just have, at the root of it, a lot of different people making a lot of different arguments that over time can add up to some sort of trend. That, that's how it works. Um, now, but especially, like I said, in the past, when sort of academia was less developed, uh, it was even more sort of decentralized. Um, and of course, that's especially true if you're talking not about academic history, but popular history, right? Um, I mean, in order to have a successful popular history book, it's not about writing what's true. It's about writing something that will be read by a lot of people, right? And so you can spread a lot of false narratives very widely. So... That's sort of the point I'm making, and that's why I think it's important to argue in favor of historical veracity and accuracy, because there's no central institution that can just dictate what is true, and there shouldn't be. We have to push <laughs> what is true uh, and argue against some of these, um, you know, incorrect uh, narratives, essentially. 
All in all, the dedicated efforts of lost causes enabled post-war Southerners to blur slavery's importance to the war. Yeah. But there was no true doubt then, and none should remain. Yeah. The exact reasons why the South was willing to fight were as complicated and simple as why slavery was the cause. Mm -hmm. Historians agree, and Confederate rhetoric corroborates, that fear drove Southerners to rebellion. Mm. Exactly what those fears were, and which were most important, is still a source of considerable debate, yeah. but three of them stand out. The most visceral fear was of the slaves themselves. This may sound absurd, but as Thomas Jefferson eloquently observed in 1820, slaveholding is like holding a wolf by the ear. We can neither hold him nor safely let him go. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I mean, that phrasing I don't love, but the idea of being afraid uh, is not absurd. You have a system where you're holding millions of people in brutal bondage. Yeah, of course they were afraid of an uprising. Southerners were whether they owned slaves or not, especially if they owned slaves. But overall, Southerners were absolutely petrified of a large-scale slave uprising. Of course, the United States had had several slave uprisings, and every time there was one, uh, there was a harsh, harsh crackdown, uh, and a bunch of bills were passed to further restrict um, the autonomy of enslaved people. Of course, there was the example of Haiti. Uh, that's a topic that I know a bit about. Uh, Haiti was absolutely abhorrent to uh, the people of the South, uh, especially the slave owners. They, they were absolutely terrified by the idea of something like the Haitian Revolution happening, right? They were, yeah, they were very scared. And once again, you can see why. I mean, you have millions of people who were kept... Uh, in slavery and treated horribly, uh, of course you were afraid that they're going to rise up. And like I said, there were several uprisings of enslaved people. Even on a smaller level, there was a lot of like daily resistance in, in sort of smaller ways. Like, you know, a lot of people would run away permanently or temporarily. We might call that marinage. You know, they would escape. Uh, there's the, the what we call the Great Dismal Swamp in this area, um, which was this very inhospitable region where uh, a lot of enslaved people would run away from their plantations and go and live there as uh, maroons, right? Slave people who had uh, run away from slavery. Um, you know, people would break farming tools. They would work more slowly. Uh, they would keep things they were supposed to turn over. There, there was a whole lot of things enslaved people would do every day to try and resist the system that they'd been forced into but the most frightening of those <laughs> to the slave owners was open armed rebellion uh, and like i said not only to the slave owners but to really a lot of people throughout the south they were very afraid of this lived in perpetual fear of slave uprisings and with good reason many of the richest slave owners were classically educated and familiar with Spartacus and the Roman servile wars. They drew yeah, but I mean, they need not be familiar with classical history. They can look at the history of, like I said, Haiti or just the United States to see other slave rebellions. Through parallels between themselves and those ancient Italian slave owners who had been cut down by their slaves. You see, we're going to Haiti. <laughs> More pressingly, the Haitian Revolution, yeah. which happened only a few decades before the American Civil War, was still fresh in everyone's memory. The brutality and cruelty of that conflict were bad enough, but far worse for the southern slaveholders was the 1804 massacre of surviving French citizens on the island. Yeah. Southerners, even those who didn't personally hold slaves, feared suffering the same fate if they lost control of their slaves. Mm -hmm. Demographics made this fate seem highly plausible. And there was, I'm trying to remember now, I think it was the Denmark Vesey conspiracy which was a conspiracy uh, in the United States, but I might be wrong, so you, you should take this with a grain of salt and fact check it, but I believe it was the Denmark Vesey conspiracy where there was some talk that um, that conspiracy had been inspired by Haiti and perhaps there was some connection back to Haiti. I'm not sure how uh, real that was because there was a lot of, uh, that's sort of a difficult thing to substantiate, but there was essentially some evidence that Enslaved people, um, in different instances, had heard, or free people of color even, who were sometimes involved 
with these plots and conspiracies and uprisings were familiar with what had happened in Haiti and were inspired and perhaps even had links back to Haiti. So there was even perhaps some connections there. According to the 1860 census, the United States population was approximately 31 million, of which about 4 million were slaves. Yeesh. The free population in the states that formed the Confederacy was about 5.5 million, with about 3.5 million slaves. Look at that. You're getting close to a 50-50 split. And I think in some states, especially somewhere like uh, South Carolina, I don't know what the numbers were, but I think in states like that, you might be even closer or even at a 50-50 free enslaved population split. So if you're talking about fear of an enslaved uprising, if half of your population is enslaved people, yeah, you've got a lot to be worried about. Uh, of course, in Haiti, the I think it was like 90% of the population was enslaved. I mean, it was... Uh, a very extreme case. Of course, I mean, it was a Caribbean slave colony. So like a lot of those places, uh, the enslaved population was extremely high. The American South was less extreme, but still, that is a large percentage of your population that is enslaved. South Carolina and Mississippi had more slaves but than free citizens. There you go. More than half. There you go. Which was a contributing factor in those states being the first two to secede. Hmm. In the event of a widespread, dedicated revolt, state governments feared they would lack the manpower to put down the rebellion. Worse, the North might simply watch the rebelling slaves exact just retribution and do nothing, which certain firebrand abolitionists certainly advocated. Mm. In the slaveholders' minds, releasing their slaves from servitude could only end in disaster, even as they encouraged the slave population to grow. There had already been a number of localized slave rebellions yep. which had been defeated more by luck and by the rebels' mistakes than any competence on the Southerners' behalf. The Southerners foresaw an oncoming disaster of their own making, which an indifferent North might allow. <sighs> However, they needed slavery too much to make any choice but to hold on as long as possible. Yeah, they were... Uh, it's like this situation where they insisted that slavery was necessary to their society and so they perpetuated slavery and they tried to increase the slave population in a variety of ways um disturbingly um but at the same time they were absolutely fearful that their growing enslaved population would rise up and kill them all right so you know it's kind of, it's a and of course the response to that was to be even more brutal to uh, the slaves, right? Enact even more restrictions, be even more violent um, because they, they were like, well, this is how we, we tamp down on a revolution. Uh, but of course, in doing that, you only make people more uh, angry and more willing to go into revolt. So like I said, as we can see, this was not a sustainable institution. Even if the Civil War hadn't happened, there was going to be, I think, some sort of major blow up at some point. A related of course, it's if we think about Haiti, Haiti is a much smaller country than the south of the United States. And so, you know, organization and also there were a lot of uh, a high percentage of Maroons who had fled into the mountains in Haiti. I think certain factors made it um, more feasible to organize. We look at the southern United States. This is a big region. It's extremely difficult to organize a slave rebellion across and beyond this entire region, right? Because, I mean, wasn't, you know, some other states also uh, had uh, slave ownership at a lower level. But, you know, uh, um, you know, of course, the South just owns the, the vast majority of those slaves. But it's extremely difficult to organize a slave rebellion across this entire region. Um, you know, notes to John Brown, who <laughs> tried to do exactly that. His plans were, uh, we could say, a little ambitious, uh, and you can see why that would be so difficult. You know, you have enslaved people isolated on whatever plantation they were enslaved on. And, you know, there was some communication and people would run away permanently and temporarily. And there was, you know, some connection to other places. But over this entire region, that is a f very difficult thing to organize. And so a lot of these uprisings and revolts tended to be localized. Did fear was the loss of political power. Freeing the slaves would mean giving the black man the right to vote, and even if things didn't turn violent, 
the sheer number of former slaves would be a threat at the ballot box. Yeah, well, unfortunately, freeing the slaves didn't necessarily, as we saw, you know, slavery was ended, Reconstruction, which there was a big effort towards civil rights, and facilitating, um, you know, black people, freedmen, newly freed people voting, and then you head into the Jim Crow South, and all of that is restricted, right? Um, you know, these uh, intense restrictions, uh, blocks were placed um, on black people voting uh, in the South and, and beyond the South. But of course, once again, it was most intense in the South, uh, because uh, of course, that's where the majority of the black population was, at least at that time, right? Um and so, but of course, they're, they're, they were afraid. Remember, these people we're talking about were white supremacists to one degree or another. They literally did not believe that black people were equal to white people. They believed them inferior. And so that's one of the reasons why they kept them enslaved. Uh, but also, they couldn't imagine freeing these people and then allowing them to participate in politics. That, that was sort of unthinkable to them. Um, and as we saw in the actual aftermath of the Civil War, like I said, uh, a lot of these Southern politicians did their absolute best to restrict that political activity. Southern whites feared newly enfranchised black voters taking political power away from whites and possibly using it to oppress them as they'd been oppressed. Hmm. And of course that didn't happen, but in the, you know, the freedmen vote following the Civil War, they voted very strongly for the Republican Party. Um, and the Republican Party was the party of anti-slavery and the party of the North at the time, and the Democratic Party was the sort of pro-slavery party uh, of the South, to put it very simply. And they overwhelmingly voted for the Republican Party. Now, they didn't vote to <laughs> oppress the whites. That, that didn't happen. Uh, but they definitely voted for the Republicans. They, they did not vote for the Southern Democrats. <laughs> more immediate fear Usually. was their states losing relevance. The South was rapidly losing power to the North and West, and it feared that soon the other <laughs> regions would simply stop caring about their needs and push their own agenda. Right, and, and this is why, before the Civil War, I mean, the existence of slavery was a the central question, but really how that emerged was the expansion of slavery. Because, now if you look at, you know, your abolitionists, a fair number of them wanted to end slavery in its entirety, and there were different timelines, right? Like, do you want to end it immediately? Do you want to end it over a period of time? But remember, like, most Northerners weren't abolitionists. This is a minority of the population we're talking about. I think, I don't know what the stats are. I'd imagine most Northerners probably didn't love slavery, <laughs> but a lot of them were not, like, strident abolitionists. And a lot of them were also very racist. I mean, even anti-slavery advocates, even some abolitionists were very racist uh, in their belief system. And so, really, the big question in national politics was not, you know, the end of slavery. You didn't have a lot of politicians who were trying to end it right then and there. It was the expansion of slavery, right? Because this is the United States in the mid-19th century. This is a country that's rapidly expanding westwards, manifest destiny all, and all that, conquering new territories, bringing them in as new states. And the question was, okay, should slavery be legal in these new territories? Um, and when you look at someone like Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was not elected on an abolitionist platform. He did not promise to end slavery. What he did promise was to end the expansion of slavery, right? That was a more common position among anti-slavery politicians. And there was a lot of, you know, Lincoln and uh, Stephen Douglas in 1858 had some debates about this over uh, uh, running for the Senate. Uh, they were both running for the position. Uh, and Stephen Douglas represented, I guess, the more like moderate position uh, of what was called popular sovereignty. The idea was when a new territory was brought into the Union, uh, you should allow the people of that territory to vote on whether slavery should be legal or not. Um, that ended up being, or that was at the time in the 1850s, a disaster. There's an event called Bleeding Kansas in American history 
where that policy was implemented. All right, the people of the territory will get to vote on whether slavery is legal or not. And unsurprisingly, a bunch of people flooded in uh, to vote on that, and it very quickly became violent. There was a lot of, I mean, this is sort of, <laughs> it's the Civil War before the Civil War, right? You had years of bloody fighting between abolitionists and pro-slavery advocates because of this policy. But that was one position. And then Lincoln, like I said, was anti-expansion, and I think probably personally opposed to slavery, definitely personally opposed to slavery, but would not commit to ending it right there and then. I think, and Lincoln's an interesting guy, you know. I, I, he's one of my favorite presidents. He's an interesting fellow who, like, that was his position at the start of the Civil War and, or, and before the Civil War. And, and Lincoln, at that time, you know, he definitely held what we'd call a, a sort of white supremacist worldview, where he, he didn't believe black people were equal to white people. And he was even interested in colonization, um, which was a movement at the time that suggested that when black people were freed from slavery, they should be sent somewhere else, uh, oftentimes to Africa. Um, Haiti was a suggestion. So the idea was that, you know, uh, even if you're anti-slavery, there was this white supremacist belief that white and, white people and black people couldn't live together and black people would essentially have to be deported once they were freed. That was something that Lincoln and some of the people around him considered. It's a very complicated topic, right? It's, it's more than that. But Lincoln was someone who throughout the war, I think, actually became more and more of an ally to um, civil rights advocates, uh, including one Frederick Douglass. I think his interactions with Douglass had a big influence on how Lincoln viewed things. And by the end of his presidency, not only was Lincoln, of course, very anti-slavery, but he was far more pro-civil rights. I think he'd really left a lot of that white supremacy behind, and he truly believed in black people and white people in America living side by side and granting black Americans sort of full political rights equal to white people. So, yeah, I think Lincoln's a really fascinating case, um, and there's a lot you can look at with his sort of political journey over the years. There's also, of course, when you talk about that, an argument to be made that we can never know what's going on in someone's head, and people will make the argument that Lincoln was forced to sort of moderate his political positions for the base that um, he was cultivating. And so there's an argument that maybe Lincoln was more anti-slavery, pro-civil rights, um, but he was forced to sort of moderate that um, prior to the Civil War. That's kind of difficult to say because we don't know what was going on in the man's head, but at least publicly, we do see this sort of shift over time. Um, anyway, just some interesting stuff there. The slaveholding states had agrarian economies that depended on a favorable balance of trade and low industrialization to be profitable. However, both the North and West were rapidly industrializing and were looking for increased government spending on infrastructure and protective tariffs. Yeah, this was one of the big economic splits. Though I will say, and appropriate from the fact there are some in the South these factories representing industrialization. The North in particular, the Northeast was industrializing at a far faster rate and it was a lot more industrialized than the South. But I mean, the South was slowly bringing some industry. It wasn't like nothing was happening, but there was a pretty big disparity, uh, which meant that they had very different economic positions, politics wise, very different positions on tariffs in particular. This was a massive debate between the North and the South. But I will say, you know, of course, the vast majority of the enslaved people down South did plantation work, but there was also a system of renting out slaves. Um, and so you could, if you own slaves, you could rent them out to someone else to do any kind of labor. Um, I mean, whatever you agreed upon. And so there was a system where Slaves would often be rented out to uh, do mining, for example, or a mining company might own slaves um, who would mine for them. And there were even some, like I said, not many and pretty sort of low scale industrial operations that would use enslaved labor. So it, it sort of makes you wonder, the South was not very industrialized at this point, but, you know, in this, you know, alternate reality where perhaps civil war hadn't happened, you know, would the South have continued to industrialize? Would it have sped up? Would it have stagnated? And how would uh, industrialization have existed alongside slavery? 
or could that not have worked, right? Would they have had to not industrialize or would slavery have faded as industry arose? I think it was a sort of common perspective that the sort of, I guess, like free market, free labor capitalist system of industrial America didn't, wouldn't have worked alongside uh, the chattel slavery of the South. Uh, that's one perspective. Once again, it's sort of a counterfactual. It's hard to say, but it is something uh, I do sort of think about. And like I said, it's worth remembering that the South didn't have no industry. It had a little, and slavery was involved in that little bit of industry, <laughs> but far, far less than the North, which definitely economically separated them. Given that most immigrants were moving to the North and West, it was only a matter of time before non-Southern interests dominated national politics. Mm. It was already clear in 1860 that the so-called slave power was dying. Yeah. Nine of the first 15 presidents were Southerners, and the ones from the North had relied on Southern votes to win their elections. However, when Abraham Lincoln- Think of all the Virginians that were present in those early days. You go through those first couple presidents, you'll find a lot of Virginians in there. And <laughs> handily won the Electoral College, despite not even being on the ballot in much of the South. Yeah. It was clear that the slave states were now in the minority, which was unlikely to ever change since few areas west or north of Texas were suitable for cotton production and therefore slavery. This economic bottleneck was a key Southern problem. The antebellum South was utterly dependent on slavery. Ever since they were first settled, the economies of the southern states had been built around agriculture, with mm. large plantations being the economic capstone. This system was nearing collapse in the 18th century due to the falling prices of southern cash crops and the devastation of its soil. Yep. Eli Whitney's cotton gin yep. changed everything. Cotton was native to the south and grew well even in depleted soil but cultivation was minimal, due to the seeds being extremely hard to remove by hand, limiting production to one pound of cotton per day per worker. Jinns, which had existed in India and China for several hundred years, but never made it west, easily sorted the seeds from the fiber and could process 50 pounds of cotton per day. Meanwhile, Britain was in the throes of the early industrial revolution, built around its textile industry. Thus, at the same time that the South began bringing cotton cultivation online, Britain developed an almost insatiable appetite for cotton. Yeah, and so th this absolutely turned the South's economy around. I and I think they're right, by the way. You know, the South's sort of plantation economy was really struggling in the sort of late 18th century. And I think another counterfactual, if not for the cotton gin and cotton plantations, I, I think you might have seen an end to slavery much sooner just for for economic reasons because i mean at the root of it this is an economic institution um it's it's a lot of things it's a social institution political uh you know it's about a lot of things but i i do think and different people have different opinions i do think that it, the main thing is to make slave owners money um alongside everything else you know um but you know that's not what happened, right? It, it didn't die out because you got the cotton gin, uh, which allowed for the cultivation of cotton at a much higher level. And the South essentially became you know, sort of a monoculture in terms of agriculture, where before that, of course, you'd see a lot of cash crops, like you might see tobacco and sugar and coffee and stuff like that. Um, but it essentially became a monoculture of like just cotton. Of course, you know, you would see other things on plantations in the antebellum South, but by the sort of late antebellum period, right before the Civil War, cotton was essentially everywhere. Uh, that's what was keeping the South's economy running. And as they pointed out, and, and this is, you know, if you know, you want to understand, follow the money, right? That, that's how I think sort of economic analysis is a good way of understanding history. You know, the institution of slavery is kept alive by this uh, production shift in cotton sort of switches up the economy at the same time as Britain in particular is industrializing, but other countries are industrializing as well. Britain's just ahead. And especially for Britain's textile manufacturing, they're beginning to rely on cotton imports. You don't see a lot of cotton grown in Britain, right? <laughs> and so they rely on cotton imports at this time, mostly from the South. 
Now, they'll have to compensate for that after the Civil War. You'll see a lot of cotton growth in Egypt, for example, uh, and I believe in India, too. Of course, Britain was getting up to their own nefarious schemes in their colonies. Um, um, but Britain was relying on that Confederate cotton to run their fastly growing industry. Uh, and this is also why, during the Civil War, Britain, they didn't side with the Confederates, but they were looking a little shifty, right? Uh, and this is true for a lot of the European powers. They sort of stayed back a little bit, right? They didn't necessarily want to get involved, but Britain especially, they did fraternize with the Confederates a little bit. There were meetings between diplomats, Confederate British diplomats. There were some connections. It was all very scandalous, actually, especially for the United Kingdom, which had this image of this sort of abolitionist country, right? You know, they had ended slavery and all that sort of stuff. And you know, the self-importance, <laughs> they love to frame themselves that way. And yet, of course, they had this industry that was reliant on cotton picked by slaves, and they were seriously considering, I think, backing the South, um, which, for economic reasons, even though it politically would have looked very bad. Now, I think Lincoln, um, oh, once again, it would have looked bad, but also Lincoln, he was a smart guy. Uh, he took a couple of steps, especially the Emancipation Proclamation, to really frame the conflict in a moral light, to say, hey, this is about slavery, and this is a moral question. So, you know, if you want to back the Confederates, you can have that to deal with, right? You're, you're doing... <laughs> and I think the European powers, especially Britain, were kind of like, meh, yeah, I don't really want to deal with that. Now, who knows, maybe in a different timeline, they would have actually backed the Confederates, but I think they knew it didn't look very good, especially the way Lincoln was operating. They were like, all right, we're going to back off. We're not going to, we're not going to stick our hand into this conflict, but there was some serious consideration there because of these uh, economic connections between the South and the United Kingdom. This turned cotton from a pesky weed into white gold. The South traded cotton at top dollar to British ships at their ports in exchange for British manufactured goods. This trade was phenomenally profitable for both sides, yeah. as by 1860, 57% of US exports were Southern cotton, worth $191 wow. million. Dollars. I mean, that, that, that shows you the power of cotton, king, sometimes called King Cotton, right? I mean, it was absolutely monumental in the amount of money it was making. And you can begin to see why the South's economy was absolutely dependent on slavery. It was making them so much money. This made cotton planters the richest men in America for decades. King Cotton completely rewrote the South's economy, and production soared. This system could not exist without slavery. The most profitable type of Southern cotton could be harvested up to seven times a year. Cotton had to be picked by hand which was unpleasant in the southern heat and dangerous due to the plant's rock-hard and razor-sharp bowls. Yeah, it turns out that, and you can see this because a lot of this agriculture, like I said, was shifted to other places. And if you look at the agriculture done in these uh, European colonies, it was also done through coerced labor of some kind. We're not necessarily talking about southern chattel slavery, but a lot of these imperial... Uh, countries, a lot of these European empires also utilize coerced labor because people really don't want to do this kind of work. It's very brutal. Uh, you can look at Haiti's a great example. Haiti was, I mean, I don't, you don't really need to compare, but it was one of the worst in terms of the slave colonies. It was an extremely brutal plantation system you know, um, I mean, with disease, uh, the weather didn't help. And it was also, they had a lot of sugar plantations and it was very, very brutal um, to harvest, to cultivate. And a lot of people would lose limbs in that process. I mean, it was, I, I think Haiti was known, Saint-Domingue was the name of the colony before it became a country. Uh, it was known as one of the most brutal of the slave plantation systems. And that combined with other things is why uh, the population rose up, but also following uh, the Haitian Revolution, 
the governments of Haiti had a really hard time getting their population to return to those plantations, and in fact used a sort of variety of coercive systems to get them to. Um, not slavery, but, you know, a variety of coercive methods. Uh, and even then, it, there wasn't really too much success because people just really didn't want to go back to that backbreaking labor. Um, even if they weren't enslaved, it's just really brutal to do. And so, like I said, turns out when you can't force people to do it, people don't really want to do that kind of labor. The profit maximizing amount of labor was one hand per 10 acres, picking 200 pounds of cotton per day. Cotton would readily grow in any warm, humid climate, but it wasn't possible at the time to increase yield per acre. Growing more cotton required more land, which required ever more workers. And, Lurie, and, uh, this is another reason why the expansion of slavery was such a hot topic, is that Part, because, okay, because, <laughs> I'm getting like, you know, excited to explain all this. Uh, because the South was essentially an agricultural monoculture, right? They had this one crop that they relied on. And because it was so profit dominated, right? It was about growing as much cotton as you could and then selling it. They would wear out the soil, right? They were not <laughs> very good. Well, I was going to say they're not very concerned with soil maintenance. They were concerned they just didn't do it, right? Because they wanted to make, you know, this is the, the profit incentive, right? They wanted to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible. And so the South needed slavery to expand. They needed new land for cultivation, right? For, for that economic reason, they needed new land because they were using up all the soil they had. <laughs> they were going to, you know, I don't know how it actually would have worked, but they were like going to run out of good soil to cultivate cotton on because they were using it all up because they were cultivating so much so often. Um, and so that's another reason why the expansion of slavery was such a big topic. Non-enslaved workers to such a back-breaking job would have required extremely high wages. Right, I exactly. So the system doesn't work. <laughs> if you can't coerce the labor, the only way to do it is to pay these people a lot of money in order to cultivate cotton. And then the, the business, like, doesn't work. Or, you know, the, the plantation owners don't want to do that. I mean, they're not going to go from having free labor to paying a very high wage to these laborers, right? And so, like I said, <laughs> sort of the only way to perpetuate it is to use a coercive labor system all of them having literally no other choice. Right, exactly. With the American frontier promising limitless possibilities and the rapidly expanding northern factories always hiring, southern planters couldn't compete in the labor market and maintain their profits. I mean, think of this, even following the Civil War, you know, some cash crop cultivation remained, um, but usually only through the system of sharecropping, which, once again, it's not chattel slavery, but it is a sort of coercive system where freedmen were essentially loaded up with debt and, you know, they were essentially tethered to these plantations and they would keep having to grow these crops and give a lot of the yield um, to the plantation owner in order to pay off that debt that they couldn't pay off. You know, it was a coercive system. And <laughs> that was one of the few ways that they managed to keep it going. But even then, a lot of the freedmen... You know, you have like the great, several waves of the Great Migration would migrate out of the South to these industrial centers because, I mean, look, it, it's not great to work in a factory at this time, absolutely, but apparently a lot of people would rather do that than, you know, work the fields um, with cotton or, other, you know, these other cash crops. Therefore, the lowest cost option was slavery, which was a steep investment up front in exchange for very low maintenance costs over the long run. Mm. This resulted in plantation owners pouring money into buying increasing amounts of slaves and land unsuitable for anything but cotton farming. An 1860 estimate suggests that the total value of American slaves was at least $2 billion <sighs> at wow. a time when total government revenue was about $4 billion. And you know, as the antebellum period went on, you actually saw the financialization of slavery essentially because look at how much money was invested into these people right because 
remember, I mean, that's abhorrent, but chattel slavery, the idea is that these people were the property of these plantation owners. And if you have a massive investment in property, you know, what do you do? Well, you do things like get insurance on that property or mortgage that property. Yes, stuff like that was happening as time went on in the antebellum South because the enslaved individuals themselves were such a big investment, right? This isn't just about the labor. That's the biggest part of it. But it's also about the the asset itself, right? The, the property that these slave owners claimed, um, the enslaved person. And, you know, people would, say, take out loans based on collateral uh, from banks. And what was their collateral? Their slaves, right? So if they defaulted on that loan, the bank would seize and sell off those slaves, Um like you would with other property. It's horrible to say. Or if you had a slave that you were renting out or you were sending over a long distance, you might insure that slave or you might take out a mortgage on your, right? Um, it's, it's an interesting combination of these sort of newly emerging financial systems and the uh, system of slavery in the South. You don't often think, th this is one of the reasons also why I brought up the South had some industry and that slavery was involved. When you think about the antebellum South and slavery, you don't often think about industry or finance or things like that. But these things were emerging in the early to mid and late. But we're talking about the early to mid 1800s, the antebellum period. And I mean, slavery was such a big moneymaker. Of course, slavery was involved in these emerging systems. Almost all Southern wealth was tied up in slavery. Yeah. By this point, the Southern states were totally reliant on a dangerous economic system. Yeah. Known alternately as Dutch disease, the resource curse, uh, and a right. rentier economy, yeah. it created a system of dramatic inequality and economic stagnation in which extraction of a high-value resource is so profitable that all other industries struggle to compete. Yeah, I haven't heard slavery described that way, but yeah, I guess they're right. Sort of a rentier economy where you have an economy based around one industry, usually resource extraction. We're talking about a rentier economy. We're oftentimes talking about oil because <laughs> there's some countries out there that they make all of their wealth off of oil because oil is a big money maker. And it sort of takes away from every other industry they could have. And these countries sort of struggle to develop other industries. Like I said, I haven't heard the Antebellum South describe this in that way in particular. But yeah, essentially you have a system where, you know, slavery, especially cotton cultivation, it made up like almost the entirety of the South's wealth. And though other industries coexisted, and there was a slow industrialization, very slow. It really struggled to exist alongside this system, slavery, that was this industry that was just so profitable. You know, because, you know, it's the thing, it's the same thing where you're using up all your soil and then you need more soil. You might say, well, why don't you take a long-term view? <laughs> why don't you take a break from the cotton cultivation, maybe cultivate something else, you know, bring health back to the soil. Because that's that, that won't make the most amount of money the quickest way, right? That's what these people want. Uh, and so it's kind of the same thing here. It's like, well, you know, l sure, long term, it might be wise to invest in some other industries, build them up, because this institution of slavery is obviously very uh, unsustainable. But why would you do that if you could make a lot of more money investing in cotton cultivation? You know, that, that that's the sort of profit motive at work there. Um, it, it can often lead to these sort of short-sighted uh, decisions. Uh, that's just on an, an economic level, right? Slavery was unsustainable economically, also unsustainable on every other level, <laughs> you know, morally, socially, politically, uh, but even economically, it, I think in the long run, um, you know, you, you were going to, it was not a healthy economy. I'll put it that way, right? That, that's probably the best way to put it. It was making a lot of money, but it wasn't a healthy economy. The easy money in resource extraction leaves little incentive to invest in other economic sectors, and so they are left to wither and frequently die. Right. Thus, a rentier economy becomes dependent on the resource, mm -hmm. and should that sector decline, 
the entire economy collapses. Yeah. This causes an enormous wealth gap between those who profit from the resource and the general population, leading to instability. Most rentier states in the modern world use a combination of violent oppression and social welfare to quash dissent. Mm. The slaveholding South certainly used extreme violence to keep the slaves in line, but not the white population. While the cotton economy created a highly privileged class of plantation aristocrats, the vast majority of Southerners were poor farmers. Yep. About 25% of Southern families held slaves, but only about 8% had more than 10, and only 0.1% of planters had more than 100 slaves. Yeah, so uh, this is why I talk about the, the planter elite. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe the top 8%, but really that top 0.1 or you know, 1%, somewhere in between, these were the people who held a lot of the power, held a lot of the political power, a lot of the social power, a lot of economic power. These were the people making the decisions, right? Especially, you know, America is a country that would become more democratic over time. Even at this point, the United States was more democratic than it had been at its founding. But a lot of these states in particular were not very democratically oriented because they had these very small slave-owning elites who sort of wanted to keep that power for themselves. Now, they still had to keep this 75% of the population not too unhappy, I guess I'll say it, right? Because they didn't want an uprising of their own people. But one way to do that was the sort of social institutions of the South, the white supremacy, where one something that brought people together was the racism and shared fear of a slave uprising. Two, there's sort of, there's this phenomenon where if you're a, a small time white farmer, a white yeoman, uh, and, and you don't, you don't own very much land. It's just you and your family farming. There is something to the idea that these white Southerners could say, well, at least I'm not on the bottom of the rung. The slaves are. Um, and that provides, if you're sort of one step up, it makes people feel a little, a little bit better, unfortunately. Uh, and that was something very much weaponized by the planter elite in order to keep uh, this large percentage of the population uh, in tow. And like I said, not too unhappy. <laughs> I'm not saying the majority was thrilled with the leadership they were getting, but at least to the point where they weren't, you know, staging a rebellion. <laughs> However, even Southerners who held no slaves heavily supported slavery and the overall Southern economic system. Right, and uh, if we're talking about the support for slavery, also the fact that the entire Southern economy revolved around slavery. And so even people who did not own slaves probably had something to do with slavery. You know, the, it, some economic investment in the system beyond just owning slaves. While the reasons for that support are complex and yeah. controversial, one in that yeah they are very complex. That's why I'm I'm picking at a bunch of different threads here. It is complex, you know, because you know you see okay, seventy five percent of people didn't own slaves. The question is then like why did they support slavery? It's a complex question with a complex answer, right? There are economic reasons we just covered. There are sort of political reasons. There are social reasons, right? The sort of social structure I just talked about. Um, like we said earlier, this peculiar institution was really at the heart of the South at this time period. Sort of everything in many ways revolved around it. And so even if you didn't own slaves, you were still, um, it was still part of your life in one way or another. Important reason was aspiration. In theory, a poor subsistence farmer needed only one year's food surplus to switch to cotton growing. The profit from one year's cotton harvest would be enough to start buying slaves to take over the work. Once slaves were working the land, wealth came quickly and exponentially. How often this actually happened is hotly debated, but it was- Yeah, I mean, you can see from the very small percentage of people that owned like over 10 slaves that it wasn't actually very frequent, but the idea of social mobility is powerful even if social mobility itself isn't really a reality. I mean, you know, look at America today. Social mobility is not in a great spot right now, but the idea of, you know, like the American dream or moving upward is still a very powerful one, even if not a very common one anymore. 
was at least theoretically possible. Thus, the allure of being an elite planter was enough to keep the majority invested in the system. Yeah, I, mean, I think I was one part of it, but like I said, I think there's a lot of other reasons that were more influential, right? I think some of that planter elite pandering to the population, I think that sort of social structure of white supremacy, um, where you might be a small time white farmer, but you're, you know, you live in a society where just being white sets you above, um, a large chunk of the population. Um, I think the entire economy was implicated in slavery. So I, I think there's a lot of reasons. Common talking point of the lost cause myth is that if slavery was the issue which caused the war, why didn't other nations have one to end slavery? All the New World empires were built on slavery, and they peacefully emancipated their slaves, so it can't be the main reason America fought itself. However, this ignores the unique aspects of emancipation in those empires. It doesn't make any sense. Also, you know, we, like, for, it doesn't make any sense. First of all, you know, historical events are unique, right? Each historical event is different. Second of all, uh, we're talking here about empires that owned these territories. Um, countries like, I mean, slavery in Britain itself had been illegal for a while, right? Uh, in the soil of Great Britain itself, on the soil of Great Britain itself, I should say. Um, also, you know, look at like Haiti. They had a revolution. They had a war to end slavery. So on multiple different levels, that argument doesn't make sense to me. Britain passed the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833, which provided for the gradual- I think we can also remember that uh, Britain was the country leading industrialization from the 1700s onwards. And so I think it was a country that you know, slavery, domestic slavery was not in its interest, right? It was relying on its industry. But what what was supplying its industry? We already covered this. It was American slavery, right? And so we can look at a lot of these countries. It's like, well, they got rid of slavery. Yeah, but at this point, we had a growing global economy. Uh, a lot of the goods they used were produced by slavery in one way or another, whether in the United States or in other countries that still had slavery, like Brazil or Cuba, right? Cuba was becoming uh, this big sort of uh, slave um, colony, right? They, they were producing a lot of agricultural cash crops. And so it's like, even if you don't have slavery in your country, uh, you very well might and do trade with a colony or country that is still maintaining slavery and so it provides this sort of, you know, separation where you can say, well, we abolished slavery, we're all good. It's like, okay, where do you get all your cotton from? Well, let's not talk about that. And so I think that also sort of messes with this argument. ...emancipation of slaves outside of India over the following 10 years. This was accompanied by slaveholder compensation of £20 million, roughly 40% of the government's budget. This compensation quelled most dissent which was already limited because slaveholders in the British Empire held less political sway than American slaveholders did. Moreover, members of the British Parliament were elected by voters in Britain proper. Yeah, there's a... I'm getting some of my argument from a, a book called Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams, who's sort of a... Uh, which the book is from decades ago, like the early 1900s, 1940s, maybe 30s, <laughs> something like that. Uh, this is sort of an influential book on the topic. Um, and, and Eric Williams is a sort of uh, important scholar in the field. Uh, he gives a sort of economic argument for the end of slavery uh, in Britain and, well, parts of the British Empire. Like I said, you definitely had a lot of coarse labor in India, whatever you want to call it. Um, but at least in the sort of Western Hemisphere colonies of the British Empire. Um, and I talked about the sort of process of industrialization. Yeah, Britain was doing a lot of slavery in the 18th century. And a lot of the money from that slavery went to fund its industrial expansion, which then outmoded the system of slavery. They didn't really need it anymore. And what they, whatever they did need, they could buy from other countries on the you know, the, the global marketplace, like buying cotton from uh, the United States South. Uh, additionally, like they mentioned, 
the sort of British planter class, the colonial planter class, did have a lot of influence at one time. If we're talking uh, in sort of the, the 18th century, mid to late. But by the late 18th century, because of these economic changes, that influence was already declining. Um, and by, especially by 1833, well, I mean, slavery was being ended, but by the sort of early 1800s, this uh, class of elite British planters was not very influential, especially compared to the emerging class of British industrialists, right? The emerging bourgeoisie uh, and all the people whose uh, wealth and jobs relied on growing industry. They were becoming more and more influential. So, you know, just looking at Britain as a specific example, the argument that, well, Britain didn't need a war to end slavery makes no sense. It makes no sense because we can look at, it's a different situation and you can point out all these different reasons for why, you know, slavery went as it did in the British Empire. Where slavery had never been legal, and few politicians had reason to ally with slaveholders beyond limited commercial interests. Thus, slavery could be and was abolished without significant political backlash. Yeah, because like I said, by the time they abolished it, it had become politically and economically outmoded. As a comparison is Brazil, which didn't outlaw slavery until 1888. Yeah. The slaveholders there had very similar fears to the Americans and had resisted ending slavery until the entire plantation system was beginning to fail. The final end came by imperial decree, almost on a whim, and directly contributed to the fall of the monarchy the following year. Yeah, so Brazil might be a better, a more comparable example and we see that there's the fair share of chaos that comes with that. And additionally, you know, Brazil's system lasted longer. But as I've, you know, been saying, it was also becoming economically outmoded. And, you know, this is one of the questions that applies to slavery in the U.S. South. Like, okay, would it have ended without the Civil War? Once again, we can't know because it's a counterfactual. But I think over time, it's pretty clear that it would have become less relevant to the economy. And that would have been a big problem for the South. Um, and I think it probably would have entered a, a sort of decline. Now, who knows how long it could have survived. But yeah, I think, you know, the economic situation was changing. Without the American Civil War, it is probable that the United States would have followed Brazil in allowing slavery to continue for the benefit of the politically powerful slaveholding southern elite. As it was, their desperation to maintain the system triggered yeah. the war that caused their downfall. It could not be any clearer that slavery was the powder keg that set off the American Civil War. Absolutely. In the next episode of this series, we will discuss the opening stages of the seminal showdown between North and South. <laughs> To make sure you don't miss it, please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. All right. Our videos would not be... Um, I didn't know this was going to be a series. Like I said, I just saw this uh, on my feed, and I was like, ooh, let's watch this one. As you guys can see, I had uh, a little bit to say about this one. <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, you know, I think a lot of things are interesting topics. I think I say that every video, but... If I thought it wasn't interesting, I wouldn't be reacting to it. So there you go. But yeah, th this this was a really good one. Um, so, some really some really fascinating stuff. Um, I, I do enjoy these kinds of videos where we're getting into sort of historical trends, cause and effect, a bit of the historiography. You know, I I, I really I do really enjoy this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this one, uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like, subscribe, check out my Patreon, it is linked down below. Um, anyway, uh, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I'll see you all again next time. Goodbye.